first time a child can run. You might remember that first time that you ran, you felt the air accelerate over your hair and your ears, and you thought, wow, that's a rush. It's not about going fast, it's about sort of being fast. It's about, it's about kind of elevating human experience into places that we've never been able to go before. You don't feel the uh, car very subtly, very gently bringing you back into kind of control. Uh, this, I think, is the biggest change of uh, the hypercar era is the accessibility of you know, a thousand horsepower or whatever it is. and say no to an open runway in a thousand horsepower car. So we go down, we go about 180. Then he tells me to slam on the brakes and take my hands off the wheel while I'm doing it in a car I've never driven, in a place I've never been going 180 miles an hour. But if the guy who has his name on the car is telling me to do something, I'm gonna do it. Capturing that imagination, the spirit of what the enthusiast wants and what an engineer wants and what an artist wants, it's really at the cutting edge of everything. And that's what makes it so amazing. It's, it's beyond art, it's beyond engineering, it's beyond sport, it's beyond racing. It's all of those things together. So as long as one manufacturer is making a car beyond what anyone else can, a child looking at it will say, something better is possible. Il bello di guidare è appunto il fatto di poter prendere questo volante e cercare con questo volante di eh, comunicare con la strada e sentire tutta una serie di emozioni che, sono, eh, che vanno a soddisfare in qualche modo i cinque sensi. I think uh, things that are kind of uh, uh, impersonated and embodies positive emotions and, and, and that you work closely with and put your love into, they kind of come alive. And I think uh, when, when you're in a car and it's done the proper way, like most race cars are, and they really feel like an extension of, of yourself. What is a hypercar? There may be no better way to ignite an argument than to try and define what a hypercar is. A car whose only purpose is to inspire awe in every aspect. The fastest, the most powerful, the rarest, the most striking, the most thoughtfully designed, the most cutting edge. And even then, that definition only takes us part of the way. 
In the hypercar, like the supercar before it, is the expression in automotive form of tomorrow, today. These cars do things that, from a powertrain and energy efficiency standpoint, that was science fiction 10 years ago. It's the car that's the ultimate expression of what they can do with technology. Really, it's like creating the Iron Man suit as a car. A car whose price tag pales only in comparison to the desire it provokes among those who can afford it. They're big projects. There are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on the line. They are very expensive vehicles to produce. A price class above what anyone else has ever made before. It's the kind of hubris that we tend to do as humans when we want to take something to the ultimate level. The hypercar is really the ultimate expression of intellect and ego. It's where those two things meet. It's the manifestation of our human instinct to be superhuman, to have that Iron Man suit, you know, as a philosopher might say, it's to recreate God on Earth. But uh, again, it's also about uh, it's also about an automotive global sausage fest between these major manufacturers, and I don't think there's any question that uh, part of it is just sheer ego. So it's brilliant. So you've got Ferrari waving its bits about, and McLaren going, "I got a bigger one than you," and then you've got Porsche saying, "We got two. Some of the biggest players in the sports car world have bet enormous budgets and their reputations on building hypercars. The Porsche 918, the Ferrari LaFerrari, the McLaren P1. These brands are locked in a battle to define what a hypercar is. And the risk is very real. After all, hypercars sell not in the tens of thousands or even thousands, but in the hundreds or less. There is a market, or there is a business model for small, highly technical, super sports car manufacturing that, that doesn't have to grow beyond 50 cars a year. You don't have to be GM to succeed in the car business. You don't have to even be Porsche or Ferrari. It's just amazing looking at these huge stands. They spend a fortune on these things for two weeks and then they tear them down again. It's just a... Uh, Shocking in a way, I guess. Christian von Koenigsegg's firm isn't a global multinational corporation, but the vehicles that bear his name are globally known for helping define what a hypercar is. Christian Koenigsegg is uh, one of the finest people I've ever met. An intuitive engineer, not a trained engineer, but an, uh, a person whose intuition is incredible. Uh, and in his own quiet way, he is changing the car business. Engelholm, Sweden is like most northern European beach towns. It's quiet and cold. But the sports car fans, Engelholm is synonymous with Koenigsegg Automotive, a company founded by a man whose desire to build the world's best sports cars reaches all the way back to his childhood. For as far as I can remember, I've been totally fascinated by cars. When I was about yeah, five years old, I went to the uh, movies with my father and saw a Norwegian stop-motion animation movie, which uh, is really fantastically made. And it's about a bicycle repairman who uh, built his own uh, uh, car on a Norwegian mountaintop to race in kind of a Le Mans-style race against the established uh, teams. and cars and drivers and of course one and this is kind of a fairy tale story but it's really made in a fantastic way and it's still shown in cinemas in Norway today on every Christmas Eve they show it on television in Norway it's kind of a national icon there uh, but I got really intrigued by this movie and said that looks like a lot of fun creating and building your own car with a lot of unique inventions and then go compete with it against the establishment so I remember that point very clearly that uh, um, I felt I wanted to do what that bicycle repairman was doing, just build his own car with his little team and do something fantastic with it. 
It's a dream shared by many, like him, who grew up worshipping the automobile. But the difference? Christian has done just that. This is an old picture from um, when we built the first prototype. This was before uh, the uh, this, this car, and um, this was in 96. Um, this is Christian and his uh, co-workers um, working on, on this car. This was in Olofström where uh, Christian started the company um, and um, stayed there. he stayed there for two years uh, preparing the first prototype. I actually lived uh, in Olofström as well with Christian uh, during this period and um, here's a picture of us back then. I think it was the 12th of August uh, 1994, I said now I'm going to build cars. So, I, so then I did everything. Um, designing, drawing, uh, creating some kind of uh, business idea, plan around it, a, a development plan. And then I started finding people around me who could, uh, who could help out. So found a, a chassis engineer and I, I found a designer who could help me make a model of my sketches. But it took, it took me two years from the day I decided to do it to have a, a full running uh, car prototype. With every new high-performance iteration, Christian von Koenigsegg and his team at Engelholm keep pushing the hypercar envelope further. But it's his latest creation that he hopes will really leave a mark. It's the Koenigsegg 1 to 1. The name refers to the perfect power to weight ratio. Horsepower to kilograms of curb weight. For every one kilogram the car weighs, its engine produces one horsepower. This is the uh, first uh, prototype one-to-one -one car that we're going to showcase at uh, Geneva Motor Show. So this is the company test car. So as all other show cars from Koenigsegg, they, they start out as a show car and then they become our test car and demo car. It will be the first production sports car with one megawatt of power. That's 1,341 horsepower in a car that weighs 1,341 kilograms. Usually we spend a lot of energy and time making our cars elegant. In this case, as it's going to be a, a road car which is also very much focused on racetrack driving, we let aerodynamics take the upper hand over elegance. So it's, it's going to look very racy on the normal road, but very at home at the racetrack. It might seem obvious, of course, but the entire car is made out of carbon fiber. The monocoque, the chassis, the bodywork, all the aero features, everything is carbon fiber on this car, even the wheels. So as before with our Agera R and the, our more normal cars, we have the most carbon fiber intense road car on the planet. And that makes it lighter, stronger, stiffer than any other car. Carbon fiber is an interesting one because in so many ways it is revolutionizing our industry and it will continue to do so but it isn't the answer to all problems. There's a feeling in the industry at times that you could solve third world debt with carbon fiber. You can't. It's brilliant because it's moldable, because it's so light and because it's strong when it's moved in the direction it wants to be moved. Of course, it's not in the direction it doesn't want to be moved and that has to be remembered. Um, in terms of f forming the structure of a car, what we'd call a tub, it's genius. Almost all parts of a Koenigsegg is made out of carbon fiber and we only use the most extreme type of carbon fiber material available which is called prepreg. It's the same that's been used in Formula One and uh, fighter jets and spaceships and things like that. Exotic materials like carbon fiber were once used solely in the realms of aerospace and motorsport. But by the 1980s, a new paradigm would emerge, and it would change everything. In the past, the top of the top was the supercar. Everything else was a sports car or a super sports car. Supercars were sports cars incorporating race technology that were street legal. The F40 was street legal. So the F40 was 
a car that came together where Ferrari used all of its racing resources, where they cared about the aerodynamics. They put it through the wind tunnel and they made sure that it had the, you know, the downforce to make it stable on the road at 200 miles an hour. You know, the F40 was a really groundbreaking car, even though it was sort of built on the 288 GTO, which was the car I had on my wall. It was like my personal favorite supercar of the time. The F40 took that platform and just kind of threw it up the technology ladder and said it's racing and road cars at a level that nobody had seen really before. The 10 years before the F40 came out were a hugely fertile time for racing technology. You had giant advances in aerodynamics. Material science had come a really long way. Um, you had materials like, you know, composites, you know, carbon fiber, Kevlar, really lightweight materials. In the early 90s, the Ferrari F40 brought Formula One racing technology to the street. A decade later, the next wave in hypercars would focus on absolute power and straight line speed. Enter the Bugatti Veyron, the first series production car to break 250 miles per hour. I think we, we created this uh, segment of hypercars. We were the very first uh, yeah, to develop a car with a top speed of over 400. And we were the first with a car with, uh, with a performance of uh, more than 1,000 1, horses. And we were, were the first to go in a price segment above uh, a million uh, euros. The Veyron is the application of technology against psychology. If you're able to buy one of these cars, it's not only your, it's not your first car, it's not your second car, it's not your tenth car, it's probably your hundredth car in your collection. And being able to throw down millions of dollars really means nothing to you. This was a, was a step change in the way people yeah, felt about an investment in a car. And people were used to spending millions on yachts or spending millions on, on aeroplanes. You know, you have to have a plane situation to be one of the people that has this car. You have to be able to ask somebody, one of your friends, and say, what's your plane situation? It took some time that people understood that the substance of the car uh, is really worth and justifies the price of over a million. It is completely unnecessary, but I mean, our car is not made for transportation from A to B. Our car is an A to A car. It is like you buy beautiful clothes. It's like you want to go for the best. What the Veyron does, giving the customer the possibility of driving in a speed category where he has not been with his supercars before, obviously left something to desire for the other manufacturers. Other players in, 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 in this arena, they actually are very thankful to us that, that we opened this field, this field of cars of uh, above uh, a price tag of a million. And for them, this also opens a market and opens the possibility to build uh, um, ultra sports cars. Koenigsegg headquarters occupies a base once used by the Swedish Air Force. Runways, from which fighter pilots once took to the skies, patrolling Sweden's sovereign perimeter and jets mainly built by Saab, are still cross the property. The guys here, they try to uh, stop the Germans from flying here, helping the uh, aircraft from US and from, from England. And this first division, uh, they always started early, early in the morning when the mist was still there. And everybody just heard them start, and they heard them land. They couldn't see them. So they said, they must be ghosts. So that's 
that's uh, it's taken up at uh, the division bench. They came to us with great pride and showed us their ghost symbol and asked us, would you do us the honor to put this on your cars? It would be a shame for it just to die just because we have to shut down. And you're doing it's something very different, but it's still kind of extreme, fast moving, fighter jet like kind of creature. So we would be very happy if you would put this on your car. So we said, with great honor, we accepted their symbol. And ever since we've been putting a ghost on each car we've built. Every car we build in that factory will have a ghost. If we build cars elsewhere, we will not put, put the ghost on the cars because they're not in that, in that premises. So we're out at the Koenigsegg uh, runway, which has been very instrumental for us in the creation of our cars and what we do. So our factory is actually a former uh, fighter jet squadron uh, hangar. And uh, here we can go 24-7, any day, any time, to test whatever we want to test, with, with very little planning. As soon as we come up with an idea for an engine tweak, a gearbox tweak, brake pads, brake discs, uh, aerodynamics, uh, whatever really, we can just go out and test. And that's quite unusual even for large car manufacturers to have that opportunity. And that has really shaped what we're doing and, and it's the reason why our cars can be so as extreme as they are, as we any time can go out and test drastically. While the Koenigsegg team has yet to finish their first one-to-one -one hypercar, one of the biggest names in the global automotive market is already in production with a hypercar of their own. Porsche's legacy of high-performance cars spans six decades. But as the first mover in unproven territory, Porsche is shouldering a big technological risk a hybrid electric hypercar. At a factory in Stuttgart, Germany, Porsche has planned a run of 918 cars built at a rate of four per day. In the hypercar market, that quantity is unprecedented. Are these big, risky decisions? Huh? When we get to the big car companies, the proper car companies, the Porsche, McLaren, and the Ferrari, that's different. The Porsche is the riskiest because the Porsche is using more complicated technologies. It's a much more complicated calibration device and it's coming from a brand that requires a higher level of finish and development, let's say. I'm not demeaning the other two, but the Porsche has to meet all the standards of durability of a Boxster. There's lots of rich people in the world now, but to sell 918 when there's another two hypercars, three hypercars on sale at the same time, is a real gamble. 918 cars, nearly triple what Porsche's closest rivals have planned to build, and each one with a price tag of just under a million dollars. And they would go on to sell every single one. Here at the Formula One circuit in Austin, Texas, Porsche factory driver Patrick Long is behind the wheel of a 918 Spider for the first time.
Yeah, the beauty of uh, this 918 is that you're dealing with a lot of aerodynamic downforce, so that initial attack on the brake is similar to the race car, and, and you're able to do that uh, with some added help from ABS um, and hybrid charging. Um, that, that generation of electricity really helps in stopping the car. The most stunning feature is its packaging density. It's the same size as a Carrera GT. It has four-wheel steering, all-wheel drive, a very elaborate multi-stage hybrid system with a crazy battery. But you can't get a postage stamp under the skin anywhere because every centimeter, every millimeter is filled with something. The man behind the 918 project is Dr. Frank Walliser, who was able to take the 918 from concept to production car in only four years. Frank Walliser, what a great guy, always smiling, under massive pressure in 918, massive pressure. You know, Porsche won't thank me for saying it, but it was a project that wasn't that loved internally. It caused massive strife, it was expensive. Did they want to make it? Should it have been in a hybrid? They were under huge pressure and Frank marshaled the whole thing brilliantly. And we really started with the development in, let me say, October 2010. And we had uh, around 200 people together, um, starting on a project, working on everything. We had a highly motivated team uh, that had a clear target. We want to make the best super sports car of the world. When I think about the 918, I think it is perhaps the most technically complicated car that will ever be built. To get everything in in, 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 in a beautiful enveloping shape that's also air efficient, that you've got room for the struts, it's insane. The thing is insane. Porsche always starts with racing, right? So Porsche starts with what works on a racetrack. What can we learn on the racetrack that we can apply to the road cars, and what, in some cases, do we learn from the road cars that can we, we can apply to the racetrack. We could really carry over a lot of technology from racing now to a streetcar, and definitely will come from this streetcar then to other streetcars down, and just makes it, makes it interesting and, and uh, yeah, important for us. It's, it's an important car for Porsche. But what's happened is, as they've developed these hybrid packages, they found so much more performance from them. And they found a way of augmenting torque, of, of creating a new way of building performance cars. And I think the discovery process has been enlightening. You know, watching Frank Vallis of Porsche go through his battles visually as I met him over the three year period. You know, he started out going, what do I do with this electricity? And then at the very end, he's confidently saying, this car is faster around a track because it's a hybrid. But okay, competition is always nice. Uh, it shows you it's, it's the best what you can get. You know who's best and uh, uh, it's objective. And uh, I think with our car, with the layout of the car, considering the fuel consumption, the performance on the Nürburgring, day-to-day -day usability, it's definitely the best package. The P1 just feels like it was just plonked on here from another planet to me, and I love that. I just stood behind it at night with lights shining in the back of it. It's just completely porous, and it's tiny, and it's small, and I think so much of that appeals. I think you need to see the effect this has on a crowd of tourists as they come out of the Yas Marina Hotel to understand how important the motor car is in our lives. And this is the ultimate expression of a motor car. And even if you don't like cars or not interested in them, when you see that shape, 
you're drawn to it. These are magnetic objects that, alongside things like space shuttles and very fast fighter jets, represent the ultimate expression of what human beings can do with the materials that we drag out of the ground. We obviously add uh, the power and torque from the electric motor to give additional you know, headline performance, but where the car is totally transformed is by using the hybrid power, the electric motor power, to torque fill. The only thing that comes close is a Formula One car. McLaren developed the P1 at its Cutting Edge Technology Center in Southeast England. Designed by world-famous architect Norman Foster, the MTC is home to McLaren's Formula One team, which is based just a few steps away from where McLaren's road cars are designed and built. Company boss Ron Dennis is said to have a particular eye for detail. And so McLaren cars reflect the sensibility of the place in which they're built. This production line is the P1 production line and at the moment we're building the P1 production cars, the 375 cars and also the P1 GTRs. So we're making a track variant of the car for customers to, to play to the heart's content on the circuit. It really is about the, um, the best technology. Our target for the P1 to produce the best driver's car, the best technology that was available on the day. The McLaren P1 is a savage automobile. Uh, it has the brightest response of any of the three cars. It has the, the most, uh, even though LaFerrari doesn't have a seat and you're sitting in the tub, the, uh, uh, the, the P1 is, uh, I, I would say, probably has the quickest reaction time but it's mostly just light. It feels like a titanium foil or something. I mean, it's just an amazing car. So P1 is about ultimate performance, ultimate drivability, ultimate driver engagement. Obviously the price tag is, is high. That enables you to really work with technology and put that new technology into these vehicles. The fact you have two driver modes in the P1, the fact you have a comfort mode for road driving, the press of a button, the car lowers by 50 millimetres, the aerodynamics, the wing raises by 300 millimetres, and there you get a car focused for the track. Uh, we were sold out before a customer had actually driven the car. Independently, three OEMs decided performance hybrids were the right thing to do in the ultimate segment in this time period, which, which, which is qu quite incredible. I actually think each car is better because the other people were doing the same thing. This current batch of, of ultimate segment cars has been a great point in history. Yeah, I think the three, the three manufacturers coming out together, present, uh, presenting these cars is great. The question is, when are we gonna get that next, that next step? 
and it's probably going to be eight to ten years time. It's going to be when, when we get that next batch of hyper cars coming out. The question is what is the technology, what is going to be the differentiator for those batch of cars? One thing about hypercars is it's not only about the cars and the technology, and we can nerd out on them all we want, but it's really about the performance that people want to know about. Which one is faster than the other? The Nürburgring is basically the whole history of motorsports on one single road. I mean, it, it was built in the 20s in the Eiffel Mountains. Um, it's the most demanding racetrack in the world. It's 22 kilometers, 144 corners. Um, it, it's the ultimate test of any car, really. I mean, it, because it tests every part of the car. The Nürburgring is the only constant uh, context of measurement a capability of cars in the history of the automobile. It's the only place that manufacturers have gone consistently over time to test vehicles. The Nürburgring is of course a, an amazing track in Germany and that it's amazing in that it's long and it has an incredibly storied history. But it's become much more than that. It's it almost has become the soul of the auto enthusiast. It is one of the last tracks that's truly dangerous that we still see commonly used. The curbs are really high, and you have to know which curbs you can hit and which you can't. It's gonna unsettle the car very quickly. The tarmac is rougher in some sections than the others, so you wanna have a suspension that is loose enough to take that, but stiff enough to keep the body you know, really level. There's sections of the track where you might have rain in another section where it's sunny and warm. All of these things come together to make a single lap in the Nürburgring almost a race in and of itself. Some of it's video games, some of it is a self-fulfilling prophecy where certain manufacturers had success there and were touting the number and then more wood and more wood and it became the benchmark. You know, they say Nürburgring tested and you see the cars being tested there because there are people with video cameras just sort of hanging around the track on industry days. But what's happening now is that, you know, people really, really want to know which of the hypercars is fastest. We have four cars that are all competing with each other, with the LaFerrari, the P1, the 918, and now the one to one. Everyone wants to say that their solution is the fastest thing around there, and right now the 918 is the only one that's published at time. So right now we know that Porsche is about at seven minutes, right? So that's the time to beat. No hypercar maker wants to be slower than seven minutes at this point. You know, McLaren's out there now, and they haven't given a lap time yet, and everybody in the world is waiting for McLaren to like, you know, say whether or not they beat Porsche. I mean, it's, it, it, it's really created so much drama in the car world. But while the enthusiast and automotive press are waiting for McLaren's lap time, Christian von Koenigsegg is back in Sweden, working to get the first one-to-one -one finished. Even though the car's not done yet, its purpose is to be the fastest car ever made. And that means it must tackle the Nürburgring with an official lap time. Nürburgring is definitely on the agenda. So that's coming, I think, sometime mid-summer, end of summer. We'll get into that seriously. And, and, and do you actually start testing in the summer there? Uh, that's the plan, yes. Test, okay. To start testing in the summer. Cool. Do you, do you want to say anything about lap times now or anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Numbering is definitely a very interesting track to test that. And uh, I don't see why we shouldn't be the fastest. We should be the fastest. That's uh, what our calculations tell us. Cool. So we'll see. When Christian first came up with the idea, it was just, yeah, we just, okay, let's do it. Uh, and uh, yeah, and now we're standing here and the car is, uh, yeah, it's getting ready. So uh, it's going to be great. 
Uh, we have a lot of testing uh, to do. Um, they're going to be thousands of kilometers on tracks, uh, finding the perfect setting. I mean, the idea is, of course, we wouldn't be here if we would have been aiming for a second position. Uh, then we could have gone home um, many years ago. So, of course, we're aiming uh, to be the quickest around the Nürburgring for street legal production cars. Uh, and uh, I mean, even if we haven't been there with the Agera R, we're very confident that even that car uh, will will set a very good lap time. Uh, and even though this is a limited edition, uh, it's still a production car, and that will be even quicker. These hypercars are amazingly engineered. They're breaking new ground. They're trying new things. It's experimentation. It's engineering. It's it's computer modeling. All of those things go into just shaving a, a hair, a hair's bit of time off of that Nurburgring record or off of that uh, zero to 60 time. For over a decade, Dan Greenewalt has been on a mission to take the cars that only a few thousand people in the world own and make them accessible to the masses via video game consoles like Microsoft Xbox. So this is actually a laser scan. There's millions of points of data in here. Even though it looks like it was modeled, this is actually just a laser scan. He's the creative director of Turn 10 Studios, the maker of Forza Motorsport. And in their small offices outside Seattle, Washington, the team is working to accurately replicate and simulate the driving performance characteristics of these hypercars. We've really been trying to establish a vision for car culture and gaming culture and be on the vanguard of what those two things mean and what they're going to be in the future. So new media, which is video games and Facebook and Twitter and everything else, has really changed how car culture works. And some people lament it, you know, the magazines are kind of going away. But new things have emerged. There's a lot of things that have come up that are filling the void. But what's really speaking to a group of players or a group of car enthusiasts that are becoming car enthusiasts? What makes them into car enthusiasts? Is it racing? It's hard to watch racing. It's, it's hard to even get it in the United States. But I see it as the responsibility of games like ours, of franchises like ours, to get a younger generation into cars, to replenish our ranks as enthusiasts. There's a hand-in-hand -hand relationship there that I think video games are taking the spot of a lot of the magazines where what was on the cover of the magazine, what's on the cover of the video game. What was the highlight story, what's the highlight race. Now you're getting to interact with it, you're getting to experience it, but moreover, today's generation, you're getting to create your own media out of it. You get to be your own magazine. You can paint the car, you can put videos on Twitch, you can have people watching your, your subscribing to your channel on YouTube. It becomes an ecosystem where the group fuels itself. And that's why I'm not too pessimistic about the future of automotive when it comes to the next generation. And as a result, the car companies have fundamentally changed their relationship to video games. They now see us as an essential way of communicating to a younger customer. They've empowered us to actually stoke passion in a new generation. The Geneva show is less than two weeks away. Christian and his team at Koenigsegg are pulling another all-nighter to get the one-to-one -one show car ready in time for its very first public appearance. No one but the team has ever laid eyes on it. It has to be perfect. The sub-assemblies, we have front and rear bumper is at sub-assemblies and polishing area. The roof is as well at the polishing. And yeah, of course. And interior in some assembly, yeah, interior is uh, in sub assembly as well. But uh, some panels are starting to come out now, and uh, we are finishing the electrics tomorrow. And after that, we can put in the interior. We were running a little bit late. We started a little bit late with this car, so we had to push really hard now in the end to actually get the car done. This is for me the most. Uh, Hard one. We've been working really hard with this uh, new car here, and uh, this is even harder than when we 
showed up the Agera first time. The one week to go with three weeks work to do, so people just stay here working, sleeping a few hours at home or coming and going or just pulling 24 hour shifts. So it's, it's really super dedicated people that brings all their energy and, and love into this to get it done. Geneva is for us the most important uh, event every year. It's the most international, prestigious car show on the planet from my perspective. It's a small show, but uh, in, in the size it's, it's somehow small, but everyone is there. If, if you're not there, you're not in the industry. Like one or two days earlier, uh, it looks like this is never going to happen, but we're really used to that because it's the same every year when we do a, a new project for, for Geneva. It just everything kind of just comes together at the last point in time. And it's happening today again and it looks really great. And I'm, I think everyone is feeling good about it. It's, it's just working out well. He's the guy that thinks that nothing is impossible. And that's uh, how he's working. It's the same as working here, as working for Christian is not for everyone. Uh, he puts a lot of pressure. Uh, not pressure in a bad way, but pressure as in he has high expectations with the people he works with. Uh, of course, because the product uh, needs to uh, meet a very high standard. The, the, that spirit goes into the people who work here and uh, into me. And it's, it's really fun because he's always motivating. Vi får prova att rätta upp det för vi ser det ut. Det ser lite konstigt ut. Jag tror att vi valde en perfekt färg här. Exakt vad det måste bli. Så du får en flash där och en flash där. Så. And uh, people may not always think that way. It's only not just a toy or a thing you buy. You actually buy a, a story, a dream that we try to create. But, but that, that's just so emotional and the car looks just, I just want to get in and drive it, that's all I can say. It just gives this fantastic uh, feedback and it's, it's ready to go kind of thing. I know what's gone into it, I know it's so for real and it's just going to, it's just going to shine, that's all I can say. power to influence your own work, that is very motivating to people. And I think that's what happens here. Breaking new grounds, uh, doing the impossible all the time. And um, that's because he truly believes they can do it. And then when someone believes in you, you can do it. All roads to the hypercar lead here to this glittering center of global wealth on the western shore of Lake Geneva. A city of royals and celebrities and the very, very rich. It's here the auto industry puts on its most exotic face, every year. It's where Italian design houses parade their automotive haute couture. The Geneva Motor Show is the one motor show that you have to go to. Uh, it, it is compact and small and Anything that's relevant is there. And car manufacturers will delay the launch of a car often to make it happen at Geneva. The Geneva Motor Show is where you go if you want to find the auto industry's most exciting, most outrageous, and rarest of birds. How are you? I'm in 
the house. Good to see you again. Oh, yeah. I've had a lot of cars. <laughs> Are you up front? Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting place here because it's um, everyone kind of lowers their guard in a sense. I mean, they're showing off their product like we are doing, but it's also an opportunity to meet up and talk in a, in a fairly casual way. And uh, it's more of an even playing field. I mean, we're a tiny, tiny little manufacturer from Sweden, but we get to talk to the big boys and the execs at the big companies, and they treat us with respect, which is really nice for us. And uh, I guess they think we're kind of an interesting flair at a place like this as well. So. A lot of interesting stuff is going on here apart from showing off cars. It's also mingling and meeting contacts and so on. I want to congratulate you on the one on one. It's just a fantastic oh, car. Thank you Brilliant. so much. Well done. So let's see. There they have the supercharger. Have a quick look. I really like Tesla. I have a Model S. It's uh, definitely one of my favorite cars. Uh, they've done a fantastic job at uh, kind of just pushing forward the EV awareness and the technology and what you get for your money. I mean, even though they're expensive, they're a great value for money. No one is even close to supplying what they're supplying presently. Actually, we could stop just quickly here. So it's kind of like a door, but it's not a door. It's just panel. This is just insane. A Ferrari V8, a trike or something. And you have these intake tracts in your face. Imagine the sound of that. <laughs> oh, did you see that cool thing at, down at Roof Porsche, this concrete thing with all the model cars? Yeah. You need to shoot that, that's super cool. This thing caught my eye. I really like this thing, I wanted one in my living room. So cool. All these model cars casting into this concrete block. Just something about it, I don't know exactly what it is, but... The Geneva Show is a triumphant moment for Christian von Koenigsegg and the one-to-one. -one. And there's something else to celebrate as well. Koenigsegg's entire run of cars has already sold out, sight unseen. The enthusiasm amongst the world's hypercar buyers bolsters Christian's optimism for the car and for his company. A strong showing at the Nürburgring later in the year will only add to the one-to-one -one mystique. But only a few feet away, a long-standing rival looms large. Its multi-million dollar display booth projects one of the world's most powerful brands, a name that has always been synonymous with the highest caliber of sports car. Ferrari. LaFerrari is about a holistic driver experience. Not about zero to 60, although it crushes. Not about top speed, although it's 217. Uh, not about cornering, although it pulls a staggeringly casual two Gs. The roads around Maranello are not great. There really are very few good roads. There's that one Ponte Simone road that we've used for years. And I think I've driven every single corner sideways and I've probably nearly crashed on every single corner. So we drove the LaFerrari there and after about a quarter of an hour, it was clearly apparent that that was not the canvas on which you could paint any of the performance. It was just too much to really enjoy yourself. You have a great company with a great history and uh, about 8,000 of the smartest people in Italy working at the campus there in Ferrari. And only the best and the best of them got to promote it to La Ferrari.
there's a mixture of emotions when you come to a place like, like Maranello because we have heritage, in fact we have unparalleled heritage. This is the home of, of fast cars, it's the home of, of, um, of the supercar, it's the home of the hypercar, this is Supercar Valley. So within a 20 mile radius we have Pagani, we have Lamborghini, we have, we used to have Bugatti and many others that have tried and failed to compete with the red one which remains the daddy of them all. Um, so we have, we have history and heritage, but also we have this, this very forward-looking sense that, that they're trying to take a type of motoring that perhaps is unacceptable to people, that perhaps needs to change, and they're making new technologies to take that forward. What comes out of Ferrari is so technically refined and reified, you know, so, uh, so, so uh, cost unconstrained that uh, when you put it all together as they have, uh, it's, just a, it's just a superb driving experience and it's a real, as I say, it's a real honor. It's like being, my job is like being uh, the art critic in Florence, uh, you know, in the 15th century because everybody's fucking great, right? You know, everybody's a, everybody's a genius. And uh, I mean, there's no shit anywhere, right? Every car is great. So, awesome. Now awesome. you should ask me about the Vagani. If you had to imagine in your mind the autocratic, charismatic creator of probably the most impressive hypercar brand to emerge on its own in the last 30 years, you couldn't actually make up Horatio Pagani. He is, he's perfect. But I have the inspiration, I find everything. I am curious for nature, that's why I observe the things, and of all the things, even from a button, I throw out an idea. Perciò la natura è, è, è di grande ispirazione. You know, he made his bones in, uh, I think, military supply and then bikes. Really, you know, frankly, he didn't even study carbon composites that long. I mean, he had a 10-month internship at Lamborghini ages ago, but the guy's self-taught, total autodidact. guy who doesn't do email and doesn't do CAD drawings, doesn't speak English, which is the universal language of engineering. He's the Italian Argentinian who says he doesn't speak English, but understands everything you say and can speak English perfectly, but chooses not to. I love that. Estetica e una ricerca tecnica. Nel nostro caso specifico, in Pagani, la ricerca estetica va un po' più in là perché noi crediamo che l'automobile possa essere un oggetto d'arte. Infatti, non voglio banalizzare la parola arte, ma io ritengo che il lavoro dei miei colleghi designer, dei miei colleghi artigiani, di quelli che operano con le mani, sia una vera espressione artistica. E noi, nel nostro piccolo, eh, cerchiamo di ripercorrere un percorso diciamo che ci ha insegnato Leonardo da Vinci, ovvero arte e scienza camminano insieme. There's a there's a creative energy to him that comes out in his car. When you especially when you go all the way to the Huayra. Quando vai a spendere come va su un milione e mezzo di euro per comprarti una Pagani e ne spendi fino a 3 o 4 milioni di euro per comprarti una Pagani in alcuni territori con la tassazione molto alta ancora di più, non possiamo mai pensare che questo è stato un atto razionale. Secondo me è qualcosa di completamente irrazionale. Perciò eh, se ti metti a pensare dici, cavolo, con quello che costa una guaira mi compro 30 o 40 de macchine, diciamo, razionali. Invece il cliente Pagani è pur e esclusivamente Emotion.
sentiamo sempre il, il, il costruttore di sogni, il costruttore di, di, che cerca di accontentare è il cliente che vuole un vestito su misura. Isn't he a mystery? Isn't he an enigmatic figure? He's the living, breathing expression of his cars. He's tangible, and I love that. He is the ultimate hypercar owner, business owner. You know, he's the man. Cioè, quello che io credo che quello che sia importante da trasmettere, soprattutto alla gente giovane, a prescindere che amino l'automobile o meno, che eh, comunque con i sogni, con la passione, eh, che, che questa energia diciamo, che ti regalano i sogni e la passione tu puoi, eh, eh, può essere utile tutti i giorni, perciò continuare a credere, continuare a credere nella tua intuizione, continuare a credere in quello che fai, farlo con, con passione, questo secondo me è un, è un messaggio che da uno che è partito da, da niente, da zero e con una intelligenza media, ecco. There's this yin and yang, there's this push and pull between engineering and artistry. And I think when you look at Koenigsegg and, and Bagani, you've got a bit of a opposite in some ways, that Bagani is really this artistry at its finest, and Koenigsegg is really engineering focused. Poi c'è Koenigsegg, Koenigsegg è un ragazzo che ha una grande passione, e fa questa macchina con un sacco di cavalli molto veloce perciò c'è la sua nicchia dei clienti che eh, ama diciamo avere un oggetto così molto molto veloce molto molto performante perciò ognuna come dicevo prima ha un suo ha un suo spazio ecco Back in Sweden, it's business as usual. The Koenigsegg team is on the runway testing cars for customer delivery. years of development, the one-to-one -one is finally ready to stretch its legs. Right now we have five of our one-to-ones in the same room, so they're kind of going out a little bit at once. Uh, we've been building them parallel to our testing program where we have had our test car running for almost a year now. Uh, and we're just at the finalization stages of that. So we've already delivered one to the customer and the other ones are ready to go out the door. So it's an exciting moment. And I hope we don't see as many of them here at the same time ever again, because it's getting crowded. So. September 2014, Koenigsegg goes out to the Nürburgring and um, they're testing a lot of the components that are going into the 1-1. One -one, um, they've put into an Agera test car. We were there for uh, almost three weeks and did a lot of miles and uh, got up to good speed. And things go wrong. Things can go wrong. One corner just, you know, messed up can cause tragedy. 
And that's kind of what happened with Koenigsegg. Yeah, we went off the track at relatively high speed, but everyone was okay, a little bit shooken up. The car was a little bit damaged, uh, but we checked the car afterwards. Technically, it looked all fine. Uh, our test driver said, yeah, it was, could have been oil slick, could have been something. The track as, as a whole felt slipperier. Well, we don't know for sure exactly what happened uh, from the incident. I mean, the actual thing that caused it. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, on the, uh, on the industry pool, you have limited, you know, you can't video as much and all that. Yeah. Uh, but so there are a few different things that could have been the cause. Uh, but we, we focus on the new, on the new, uh, new challenge. So, uh, so we'll see. You know, there is pressure to do this. I mean, these guys are under pressure to get that lap time, and not only to test the car and to test the components of it, but to get the lap time to make a good showing out there. We're very keen to get back on the ring with this car because uh, when the weather gets better, we're, we're going to be there really to see what the car can do uh, officially. But another tragedy will soon make Christian rethink his ambition to break a Nürburgring record. I often feel there's something to the danger of driving that defines a lot of things. I think some of the Nürburgring is that it's really dangerous. <laughs> it's not like other tracks. And we still have, you know, Le Mans, there's, there's still deaths occasionally there, and other FIA tracks. But the Nürburgring is dangerous on a level that you just don't see popularized or publicized quite as much. March of 2015. A fatal crash during a race at the Nürburgring. The death seems to be a final straw for officials, ushering a series of unprecedented restrictions at the track. We started getting info like uh, yesterday or the day before that uh, uh, there are speed restrictions on uh, on this area called the Flugplatz, yep. uh, where this uh, I don't know if you saw this Nissan GTR crashed out in the audience a couple of months ago in a in, in, the, in a GT race. So, so they're restricting that, that area to 250 kilometers per hour, and we knew that for a while, but that, that's not a big issue. We, we, can, we can live with that. And then there's another area called Sweden Kreuz or something, which is really restricted to 200, 250. We could also live with that. But then we started hearing that uh, Long Straight is restricted to 250 kilometers per hour, and that's where we can go 400 kilometers per hour. So that, that, that's a big restriction for us. Uh, but we said, okay, maybe we can get around that, or we'll see how fast we can go. And then they said, we're, they're not, no one is allowed to go for all our records anymore this year. So uh, all of those things together kind of put a, put a lid on it today. So we'll kind of scramble to get everything out and get ready. And now they said, hang on, hang on, what, what are we doing here? If we're not allowed to, what, what are we doing? So, um, yeah, so that's where we are, basically, suddenly. For the one-to-one, -one, the ban on hot laps at the Nürburgring now makes an attempt at a lap record impossible. We, we've already kind of done a record at Suzuka, and we just keep on going and taking a record at all the other tracks we're allowed to take records at. Disappointed, but still confident, Koenigsegg sets his sights elsewhere. We can try to go back to Spa again. I mean, we didn't even try to go for a record there. We can drive probably four or five seconds faster than what we did already. Yeah.
He's just gonna be, do whatever you feel comfortable with. Go f as quick as you can, of course. But he knows that I do the balancing between pushing boundaries and not putting cars at risk. Because anyone can go out and be super quick, but what's the risk? You can take a, you know, a world champion of something and say, go, go and do, go and do, you know, a, a lap record, etc. And, and he'll make it might make it and he'll probably be quicker than I am but he maybe will not make that at all The question is, is it worth it if you make it? Yes. Is it worth it if you don't make it? No. Spa Francorchamps, an hour west of the Nürburgring, a racetrack built in the same motorsports era. Spa is smaller than the Nürburgring, but it challenges drivers with high speeds and blind corners. It's been a long process, and I mean, it's we're never done because. As Krishna says, perfection is a moving target. So there will always be new things. I will always figure out something new with the suspension or with the air or something. So there is not really a goal for it. We just want to make it as good as possible in the given time frame. If the Koenigsegg 1 to 1 were to set a lap record at Spa, it would truly be in a class by itself. But Spa has its own dangers and its own rules and regulations.
going on at the end there? Yeah, they put Marshall in the middle of the track. Yeah, and there was red flags all over the track. In every single post, there was a red flag and there were red lights. Like, by the time I got to the end of the straight first time, the whole track led up the red. And then they had Marshalls physically on the track to prevent me from going. I mean, what, what we're doing with hypercars or now mega cars or call them whatever you like, uh, I always ask myself, what am I doing for humanity? I mean, how, is, how are these, let's say, luxury, super expensive sporting goods or whatever they are, how, how, how do they influence uh, everyday lives of humankind in a broader sense? And, and I think it does, actually. Uh, well, number one thing is, of course, uh, everyone thinks I'm living my dream, which I agree, and I think that is an important thing to show that it is possible, that it's important to dream and to, to, to realize your dream and that, is, that that really works. That is one very important part of it. But also the technology we develop, uh, we've seen many things already trickle down into more normal cars. Combustion engine philosophies, how, how it interacts with the transmission and the clutch and all of these things that are really on the edge in our industry is trickling down to more normal cars. It's like, uh, yeah, the Bugatti Veyron had one of the first uh, dual clutch transmissions. Now you're finding it in kind of any, every Volkswagen around the world, more or less. So uh, that is just happening. And, and, and it's, it's one of the few industries where that's going quite quickly from high end to low end. Christian is an inventor, I would say. Uh, that's his passion. That's what he lives and breathes, to invent new things. And at the moment, his focus area is cars, uh, but it could well be anything. Hypercars are built by people um, where there's a sort of cult of personality around that person. I mean, whether it's Enzo Ferrari built the Ferraris, um, Ferruccio Lamborghini wanted to best Ferrari, right? He, he, they were, there was a rivalry. Um, guys like Hor Horatio Pagani and uh, Christian von Koenigsegg come along and they put their names on the cars for a reason because they're personal but it this is where the ego part kind of comes in where it's they want to bend the world to their will to create something that is just um, not only the highest expression that they can come up with but the coolest thing that they've probably ever dreamed of and that they can actually put it together and and fabricate it, you know, is kind of an amazing thing for a car guy or just for a kid who grew up wishing that they could do that. I get the feeling that Christian's that guy. I think he knows what he wants. He wants to experiment with technologies. He wants to display what he can do and he wants to then sell it to people and he wants to go really, really fast. In the end, having a bloke who wants to go really, really fast is a fantastic basis for making a hypercar company. So what is a hypercar? If we believe those who build, buy, and obsess over them, a hypercar is, in automotive form, a vision for the future, today. So what is the future for the hypercar? Like others, Christian von Koenigsegg is betting on electric propulsion. His next hypercar will be called the Regera, and he'll push technology and horsepower even further using both an internal combustion engine and an electric motor. Where's it going? We're moving away from fossil fuels, inevitably. BP, a couple of weeks ago, announced that it reckoned there was 58 years of oil left in the ground. So, okay, I don't believe in peak oil theory, but, you know, we are reaching a point where extracting it's costing too much. We have to change. Human beings, the human race, has always responded to times of profound change. That's when we do things. We, if you tell us we ought to do something to mitigate against a risk in the future and we'll be lazy and we won't do anything. But if you tell us we have to change, then we will. That's why at times of world war and conflict, 
we tend to invent things much faster and build things much faster because we have to do things, we have to respond. So I think this gradual process is okay, but I think it will ramp up fairly soon. Once the oil becomes too expensive to get out of the ground, then you're going to see the electrification of the motor car. It's inevitable. Engineers are smart. We're going to keep figuring out ways to make cars go faster. My body can't take a lot of the stuff that these cars can do now. And at some point, Lewis Hamilton's body is not going to be able to take the stuff that these cars can do. That's the place we're heading to. And I think it's exactly that idea that kind of comes into our head that what, it's what makes hypercars so fascinating. A car can't do that. It can't do that. And then it does. So the, so the hypercar is the most you know, important manifestation of this democratizing force. The, it's, the, it's the ultimate manifestation of freedom, technology, and art. It is the apex of all these ideas in one statement of what is possible. However irrelevant that item, that thing is, it is, its meaning transcends its irrelevance. It's about being something that you're not, and what you're not is a, you know, 250 mile an hour beast that can kind of storm across a landscape and um, do superhuman things. And that leaves only one question. Will humanity's desire for speed endure? Is it just an anomaly of human evolution? Temporary? A fad? Or is it our desire for speed that makes us human? If someone who didn't know anything about cars asked me why hypercars matter, the only possible answer is, like jazz, if you have to ask, 